Good afternoon. Sorry for the, I am just now sliding into home base. Six o'clock and I'll call the May 31st meeting of the Planning and Zoning Commission to order. Viviana, would you call the roll please, ma'am? Debbie Moore. Present. Patrick Connell. Here. Diana Rose. Here. Cynthia Meyer. Here. Um, Sue Ann Frigier, let us know that she'll be out of the country. Um, Richard Gartman. Here. Matt Lassen. Here. Cheryl Lee. Present. Thank you. We have a quorum. We'll go to number two, item two, citizen comments. Comments will be heard from the audience on any topic not listed on the agenda, not to exceed three minutes in length. To address the commission, please submit a fully completed request card to the commission secretary prior to the beginning of the meeting. In accordance with the Texas Open Meetings Act, if a citizen discusses any item on the agenda, the commission cannot discuss issues raised or make any decision at this time. Issues may be referred to city staff for research and possible future action. To address the commission concerning any item on the agenda, please submit a fully completed request card to the commission secretary prior to the consideration of the item. Do we have any any citizen that wishes to be heard tonight? Okay, seeing none, we'll go up to item three, items for individual consideration. Item 3A, consider action to approve meeting minutes from the April 26, 2018 Planning and Zoning Commission regular meeting. Commissioners, do you have any uh, additions, deletions, alterations? Motion to approve as is. Motion to approve. Is there a second? Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Passes unanimously. Thank you. Item 3B, consider action to recommend approval of the Colony Mud 1A Section 3 Phase A and B preliminary plat being 100.289 acres out of the Jose Manuel Bank Survey Abstract 5 located east of FM 969 within the statutory extraterritorial jurisdiction of Bastrop, Texas and forward to the City Council for consideration at their next meeting. Ms. Jennifer, would you tell us what's going on here? Good evening. So what this is is uh, a preliminary plat for one of the sections of the Colony Mud subdivision. Uh, just a reminder of the process that we go through for the subdivision process is we start out at the zoning process if it's in the city limits. In this case, we're in um, a consent agreed, agreed mud, a munis municipal utility district uh, that establishes kind of their form of zoning within that, that agreement. And now we're at the preliminary plat. So at the preliminary plat, um, we look at the TIA analysis, the preliminary lot layout, the infrastructure, preliminary infrastructure design. Oh, sorry, transportation impact analysis is TIA. Uh, pr the preliminary drainage floodplain analysis, and then once PNZ makes the recommendation, that goes to City Council for them to approve the preliminary plat. The next steps after that is the um, for the developer to submit the construction plans, which shows the detailed drawings of how all the infrastructure is going to be uh, put in place, and then the final plat has to go back to City Council for approval before they can start construction on all those improvements, and then ultimately start building houses. So for this section, this is, and we, we have a lot of numbers and letters in all of the colonies, this is sec 1A, Section 3, Phases A and B. So this, that we're in this brown section, it's kind of hard to see on this map, that's between FM 969 and the Colorado River. So previously, um, we, PNZ and Council have approved, we've got Section um, 1A that's uh, been final platted. Uh, section uh, 2B and 2A um, that are all uh, under construction with the public imp the, the improvements, the subdivision improvements at this point. So this will be section uh, 3 of the 1A mud. Uh, the whole site is uh, a little over 100 acres and this is in our statutory extraterritorial extra jurisdiction or ETJ. Um, that the city that goes a one mile outside the city limits. So for a preliminary plat, this is uh, I think I got yeah. Um, it must uh, meet all of the requirements of the Bastrop Subdivision Ordinance and the Texas Local Government Code. Uh, 
all the plats that come before um, that meet all the rules have to be approved um, because the, the rules for subdivision are in place and once they meet them, um, they've met their due Give diligence. Give us some examples of what those, those rules cover, just for the audience. So for subdivision, uh, the, the rules cover lot sizes, um, the street configurations, uh, street connectivity, how, they, how the streets connect so the houses or businesses can get um, to existing streets uh, on those future streets. Uh, what that street width is and uh, how that street has to be constructed and then all the utilities that go to serve um, this and then a drainage is one of the, the bigger ones we also look at in this area and is uh, relevant in this uh, to this plat specifically. Um, and then once this one is approved and this notes a little long, the construction, the st construction for the infrastructure um, plans can be submitted uh, that have to match this plat and then the final plat. So they cannot record a final plat until the construction plans are complete and either um, that we have the money to build it or they've gone and built all the infrastructure. So we're still at the kind of preliminary phase with this preliminary plat. Oh, that is the wrong slide on that. I was copying and pasting. We're going to skip that one. <laughs> So for this section, they're building uh, through their consent agreement. They have a number of different lot standards um, that they can do a certain percentage of in the entire development. Uh, their, their biggest category is the Colony S, which is their standard um, single family residential lot. Uh, they're proposing in this section to do 231 lots, and the dimensions of those are 50 feet wide by 110 feet um, long which is, uh, and they have to be at least 6,000 square feet in size. Uh, to compare the Bastrop zoning ordinance for our single family seven, which is our um, smallest single family residential lot size, um, we require 60 feet by 110 feet. So this is a little smaller than the standard um, SF7 zoning in the city. Uh, there are also 11 landscape open space lots uh, throughout the, this, this particular section to serve uh, the, these 231 lots. Um, also, with the previous uh, sections, there are um, improvements uh, that are required uh, on at the intersection of Sam Houston and 969. So, uh, to this direction, with the, there are three sections of the plots that have already been approved that have started construction, and the um, additional ones we're talking about today on this side, so this is the main road, just kind of turn on side, where it intersects with 969. And at that intersection, they're having to do some improvements um, that they've started now to add some acceleration and deceleration lanes uh, so people can safely um, get onto Sam Houston and, get, and then also exit off of Sam Houston onto 969. In the future, as this continues to build out, um, they're, they're in the process of redoing their TIA to take into account current um, traffic counts and that uh, it, other improvements may uh, will definitely be looking at and at some point a future traffic signal at that intersection will be required but not until they've reached um, a larger number of lots. That's mandated by TxDOT, right? Mm -hmm. And that's a deal that they have with TxDOT and that, that will go through TxDOT. So until the warrants are met with TxDOT, that light won't be required. What, is there a timeline as to when the pavement will be done? Does that have to be done before they do final plats or start construction? Or where, when does this fit into the schedule? Well, they're already on, it's already under construction right now for the, those, the, those additional lanes at the intersection. Um, they're out there right now. Um, the, it should be done with those sections that are being done to the west. Uh, so the recommendation of staff is to recommend approval to City Council of the Colony Mud 1A Section 3 Phase A and B preliminary plat. I have one question. Mm -hmm. This plat, and I guess I'm, my impression of it is it's a lot more dense than the other colony lots. It's just considerably smaller. I don't. I don't think it's. I'll go back to the picture. I don't think it's any um, denser. I think it's just a lot larger than the previous ones that you've seen. Okay. Um, so previously, the, you've seen this section and this section individually. So it's, this is just a lot more lots in this area. Okay, thank you. It, correct me if I'm wrong, but is this is this not the section we looked at where they were going to try and just use a lot of natural drainage since they yes. were so close? So mm -hmm. I'm looking at the underground 
drainage system that we're putting in. I, if I recall, the west side of 969 is going to be transferred to that property. Are they just are they no longer going to try and use the natural lay of land to do that, or are they just going to tie it all in? My understanding is so for the sections on the west side, the streets, it's a combination of the streets and underground uh, storm sewer are conveying the water from this side over into uh, the Colorado. And for this area, it, the, I think the streets directly are conveying. And the applicant is here if, they, if you have more specific questions on that. Just to clarify, as always, they've met all the requirements for approval? Yes. OK. Motion to approve as is. Second. second. Motion to approve in two seconds. Is there any further discussion? If not, Vivi, would you call the roll? Absolutely. Yes. Patrick Connell? Yes. Diana Rose? Yes. Cynthia Meyer? Yes. Richard Gartman? Yes. Matt Lassen? Yes. Cheryline? Yes. And I'm I apologize for not asking you, but I assume there was no one that wanted to speak on this issue. Oh, no one's given me a comment card, okay. no, ma'am. Thank you. You're welcome. Item 3C, public hearing and consider action to recommend approval of a conditional use permit to allow a brewery, distillery, and winery use on point zero four six acres of building block 3 west of Water Street, 809 Main Street, an area zoned HMS, Historic Main Street, and 0.184 acres of building block 3 west of Water Street, 705 Pine Street, an area zoned DMU, downtown mixed use within the city limits of Bastrop and Floyd to City Council for consideration at their next meeting. Ms. Bills. So yes, this is a request for a conditional use permit to allow specifically in this case a distillery use, um, but in the form based code, the use chart requires a distillery, brewery, or winery use to receive a conditional use permit to make sure it's a, an appropriate size and scale um, for the location it's going in in a downtown. Um, this is current, this is the Copper Shot Distillery, so it already exists downtown across the street over in the crossing uh, development right by uh, neighbors. Uh, they are wishing to relocate so they have um, expand their business, have a larger seating area. Um, and, uh, and increase their production capabilities. So this area uh, is on the corners of Pine and Main Street. Uh, it's it's kind of it's two separate lots, and this one faces uh, Main Street, and it's that whole lot is the building at that location. And then you've got this uh, bigger lot in the back that takes access from Pine, and they'll be utilizing. There we go. The next slide. Uh, the front building and patio will be their uh, tasting room and outdoor seating, and then the actual distillery production will take place in an, an outbuilding that's on the other lot. So in the conditional use permit regulations, there are five uh, criteria that must be met for a conditional use. Uh, one is that the use is harmonious and compatible with the existing area. Uh, for this, this is a small scale uh, distillery production, um, and they'll also have some uh, meeting space uh, for people to come and use uh, the taste, to sit in the tasting room and try their products. Um, so it, this is compatible with the uses in the historic downtown, and it already does exist <laughs> at their current location. Uh, it also, the activities uh, must be associated with the uh, base district. Uh, this is the use here is a downtown mixed use and historic mixed use, which allows for a mix of uh, retail, commercial, and office uses. And this is a small scale production and uh, uh, tasting room use that is appropriate. Uh, that the nature nature of the use is reasonable. And again, uh, small retail breweries, distillers, and wineries are reasonable and are located throughout um, downtowns in Texas. And then um, any negative impact on the surrounding area has been mitigated. And the, the primary thing you look at in a production is that is it producing any noxious uh, noise or emissions? In this case, it's so it'll be totally contained in a building and will not uh, have any um, emissions or noise. 
The main issue is the water discharge will have to comply with the city of Bastrop utility requirements for any of the, the waste that comes off of the production of uh, the, from the distillery. And uh, any additional criteria. Um, so there are three prim uh, main criteria that the, all construction must meet all regulations. Uh, the necessary permits uh, are required prior, primary to occupying the building. Uh, building permits must be secured within one year of the CEP being issued at council. And then uh, in this instance, the wastewater discharge must comply with the city of Bastrop codes. Uh, and staff recommends that, council, uh, that P and Z recommend approval to city council for the conditional use permit. And then the next step for this would be um, going to the June 12 city council meeting for uh, public hearing and first reading. And at this point, we probably should do the public hearing for to see if anyone has any questions. Does anyone wish to be heard on this? Is there currently a CUP in place for the current location? Yes. They, okay, so they received the CUP. So for once that. we move locations, that CUP is gone then from that spot, or no? It stays there as the same same type of use that meets the same requirements. But if they had another there. tenant that wanted to move in there that was not that, then that CUP would disappear? It, yes. Okay. I mean, it'll, yeah. <laughs> okay. Commissioners, anything else? We have some comments uh, we've received from, from our neighbors. We have one uh, comment that was received from a neighboring property that had no objection to the request. Motion. Yeah, okay, go ahead. Motion to approve as is. Make a motion to approve as is. He already did that. I'll second, second. Patrick. Uh, Vivian, Viviana, would you call the roll, please, Ann? Debbie Moore? Yes. Patrick Connell? Yes. Jeff Lewis? Yes. Diana Rose? Cynthia Meyer? Yes. Richard Gartman? Yes. Matt Lassen? Yes. Cheryl Lee? Yes. Thank you. It is approved. Go forth and distill some more. <laughs> <laughs> Item 3D, public hearing and consider action to recommend approval of a rezone for the northeast corner of State Highway 95 and Chestnut Street to C1, commercial one, consisting of lots one and two of the Lee Jackson at Fowler subdivision, 1.717 acres, currently farm-based code character zone CMU, commercial mixed use, and 0.398 acres of Bastrop Town Tract, abstract 11, and 2.046 acres of building block 12, east of Water Street, currently C2, commercial 2, within the city limits of Bastrop, and forward to city council for consideration at their next meeting. It's Jim. Yes, so the request we have tonight is for a uh, standard rezoning request. So the area in question is the northeast corner of SH95 and Chestnut Street. And currently there are five lots uh, that the applicant is looking at that are zoned. The, fir the front two lots closer to 95 are commercial mixed use CMU in the form based code. And then the other three lots are C2 commercial. Um, and they're wishing to develop this entire, all, all five lots into one site, and to do that they need to be under one zoning district. Um, looking at this area, you can kind of see uh, the, this area is a little old. There had been previously um, a house there. Uh, right now it's vacant, uh, uh, undeveloped land. There is uh, a, a house on this far corner that um, is not part of the consideration and that will remain uh, under its current zoning. Within the future land use plan, this area is um, labeled as neighborhood commercial in the future land use as it is along two major roads within the city. Um, section 10 um, in the zoning ordinance is uh, contains the guidelines for considering the rezoning. So the f five criteria um, to when you're considering rezoning is to correct an, uh, an error on the map. There's, there's been no error that this has all been approved previously in previous ordinances. The applicant just wishes to 
uh, rezone to one district for their development purposes. Um, to recognize a change or changing conditions or circumstances in a particular locality. Um, this has been f in the past five existing tracks and they're wishing to replant these into one and use it as one site, which is, means they need to rectify the split zoning. Uh, to recognize changes in technology, the style of living or manner of conducting business, and that does not apply in this case, that criteria. Uh, the change uh, to property must be in uh, approved, in accordance with the approved comprehensive plan. Uh, the request to C1 is consistent with the future land use designation of neighborhood commercial. C1 is um, our, our lighter commercial use category. The, the determining factors, uh, whether use is permitted in the proposed change will be appropriate to, in the immediate areas concerning concern and their relationship to the general area and the city as a whole. Um, in this, for these tracks, these are along um, two major uh, state, state roads within the city, and it's always, I think, been envisioned that these would be commercial uses on these lots. Um, and that whether the proposed change is in accord with any existing or proposed plans for providing uh, basically all the, the public infrastructure and there is public infrastructure already existing at these sites and any upgrades will be considered during the platting process. Um, the amount of vacant land currently classified for similar uh, development in the area. Um, this is on the east side of 95 so there are some limiting environmental conditions on that side so there is kind of limited abil ability to develop so if an applicant can develop commercial tracks that meets the qual qualifications in this area and then the recent rate at which land is developed so some of these criteria are a little out of date and something we're probably going to look at updating in the future but um, over the last 10 years, we've had commercial tracks along 95 and Chestnut, and they've been, de they've been developing at a steady rate, and obviously the market is um, at a point for developing this corner. And then uh, how other areas designated for similar development are to be affected. This area is already zoned commercial. This is mostly a cleanup for um, this new lot configuration and any other factors, and there are none. So the recommendation of staff is to uh, recommend approval to City Council at their next meeting to, rec to change the zoning from the CMU and C1 to CMU and C2 to C1 for the entire, uh, a little over four acres. And you'll need to open the public hearing for comments. This is a public hearing. Does anyone wish to be heard on this? Viviana, do you have any? Good. Commissioners, do you have any questions? Do you, if you wish to be heard, sir, would you please fill out a comment card? Yeah, while we wait, the commissioners, do you have any questions? Can, can I get some clarification on what would, what, when it says better C1 is better suited for fuel sales, what's the difference? What is it that they're looking to accomplish that we're not getting now from CMU? Uh, the CMU uh, is our farm based code uh, commercial designation, and in that, in the form based code, you're obviously more concerned with form, and the requirements in the form based code for commercial is to f try to front load um, any development towards the road and put any parking behind. And obviously, this is a gas station, so most of the um, activity on this would actually be via vehicular traffic so my concern after going through the packet was this is that the city spent a lot of time and money doing the form based code mm -hmm. and this corner is has always been has always been meant to be cmu and everything in each other corner is also cmu and if fuel sales are already allowed in the cmu designation i'm just trying to figure out why we're changing something it, it, to, I'm, trying, I'm trying to figure out what makes it that much better other than it's just better for the applicant what makes it better for us as a city for that corner to mm -hmm. you know to take the corner that, that the city spent a lot of time and money deciding was going to be CMU and that's what mm -hmm. they want um, and that use is permitted there but changing the whole corner just to accommodate a better site layout seems kind of like an overreach yeah so I'd, I'd like some clarification either from the also the, the, the configuration you can see the um, have an aerial 
there's a lot of grassy area between. You've got this um, the, the dedicated turn lane off of uh, Chestnut to 95. With the curvature of the property um, and with the um, slope of this property, there's some grade that's going to have to be addressed. And then also, uh, they're, they're going to have to contend with uh, Tech Stop for getting driveways onto uh, 95 and Chestnut. So when you, when you take into account the location of driveways and all these other things, it was make, it's going to make it difficult to put a build, at least a gas station up on the, the um, to, to put it along the edge. But, the, but Tech Stop doesn't um, have really care what zoning we have for that lot, right? They're gonna, their requirements are going to be what they're going to be, correct? Yes. So are we talking about, what I'm, what I'm looking at is, is this something better suited maybe for like a variance just for like a setback here or there and still keep the zoning the same? Or, you know, would that not facilitate? That to me seems less intrusive than changing the zoning for the whole corner, even though it's clearly not intended to be that commercial one. Well, the, the entire corner will be this one property owner. So right. it's preferable to change the zoning rather than try to do variances, because variances are intended to correct a specific hardship in one location um, that's, that's, if you can if you can change the zoning instead that's preferable then to do a, a so so essentially we're taking this whole corner out and saying this corner is no longer uh form based code yes but to also i don't have a larger image but when you look at the other four corners the other four corners were developed prior to the form based code so you've already got to the south another gas station that does not meet the intents of the form base code. You've got a little strip center that also has all the parking in the front and then the movie theater that is all parking in the front. So um, but you, you're mean, kind of continuing the development pattern. Sort yeah, of we're way. continuing a bad pattern that the city spent a lot of money changing is what that sounds like to me. I guess the issue is, is why change it all to C1? Why can't we make the whole thing CMU? That would be my thought. And that's that's a possibility. I don't think the app... Thereby expanding on what the city has kind of already thought is best for that area. And, and to, in order to do that, it would require, I think, a number of variances. That was going to be the issue. And we would, would, would this not just be a, the same discussion, but taking the three lots that are C1 and just changing those to CMU? Yes, but for the, 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 the layout of a gas station and for what their use is, their end use is, there was going to be a number of variances that were going to have to be secured in order to accomplish that. I don't, I don't understand why we're necessarily trying to bend over backward for a gas station there with changing our zoning. I don't, I don't, I guess I'm not failing to understand the city's desire to put a gas station there or whatever it's going to be, but we'd have to change the zoning to do it. I also don't feel that an excuse that the other ones just because it was before the form based code, that shouldn't let them fall into the same thing because we have a form based code now. So it should comply. Well, yeah, they're already constructed. They're already, they're already right. in but existence. So. And I understand that, but I'm mm -hmm. just saying now we do have a form based code, so this should fall into that, correct? Mm -hmm. This corner or yes. the other corners? Yes. The corner that is to yeah, be it, it's, it's just specifically these two lots. So you still have. The remainder of this property that could be developed at C2, which is allows even more uses than C1. So, looking at the balance between the one somewhat hard corner um, that's not very large versus um, the balance of the property, C1 seemed like the good compromise. See, Dave, add his. <laughs> yeah, let me let me take a stab at this. Um, if the wide uh, radius of that curve was gone and it was more like a traditional intersection, yeah, we would hold, we would say that makes logical sense for the form based code. But because it's going to be set back from the intersection as it is, and in fairness to the applicant, they did make an attempt to design their gas station to meet the form based code requirement. But what that did was it moved the gas station building up to the edge of the property with all the gas in the back and what you were seeing was the back of their building uh, and it didn't have any logical relationship there's no 
you know, no pedestrian access or something that would come to the back of that building. So their proposal is that we rezone it all to the C1 in order to make a more traditional gas station. Now, you can make your recommendation either way, or you can make your recommendation with any conditions that you think would be appropriate in this particular situation. So my, cons my, my thought is this long term. Uh, movie theater, Frontier Bank, probably not going anywhere for a long time. Neither is the gas station on the corner, but it's entirely possible that the opposite corner, the southeast, uh, southwest corner at some point would be demolished and something bigger and more needed mm -hmm. would go there. And I would hate to uh, make this change now and then whenever that occurs, the excuse be, well, these were around and you changed this one and we're at the same corner and we want to do the same thing and we're looking at now changing, you know, spot changing form based code based on what somebody across the street did. Yeah, uh, I think the staff's position was not so much the intersection but 95 seemed to be a logical demarcation and maybe the form based code doesn't really fit east of 95. Because this, this is really, we're only really talking about a block or two depth, and the rest of the east side of 95 doesn't really have any form based code requirements. It's really just this particular area. As I recall, the discussion centered around the entrances to the city and controlling those intersections with the form based code to create a consistent character of the downtown area through our major thoroughfares. And so I know they spent a lot of time discussing whether or not it should extend to the other side of 95. And in the end, the opinion was that it should. Um, I guess in the end, I mean, we've talked about this a number of times before with our sign ordinance and even just changing, say, you know, the uh, subdivision ordinances, that we do this to force compliance and to bring everything up to a standard. And it feels like that's what the city has coded here, but now we're kind of saying, no, we don't want, I mean, I get they may want to put a gas station there, and I appreciate them wanting to do what, you know, they can do with their land, but we kind of create zoning to make it inconvenient to build something, to force a certain type of establishment to go in there, or at least a certain character of establishment. And I think if they can make it work with the CMU, then, you know, I think that's fantastic. But if it doesn't quite meet their business plans, then, you know, there's a lot of people in the city that end up bringing the same concern before your department that get denied immediately and don't have the benefit of you lobbying for them in front of this board, you know, on their behalf. And, you know, and so I just, I just, yeah, I mean, I just, I fail to see the city's interest in changing it based on the way we've used code in the past to enforce compliance. And the city's not lobbying on their behalf and they're here to defend themselves. I was just defending the recommendation that we made to clean up the zoning. We don't want a large lot with split zoning on it because then you have some development of one type on one part of the property, some on the rest. So. And, and, I, and I can appreciate that, absolutely. I, yeah. I guess it's just the change to C1 versus just overall CMU for the whole corner is what yeah. I guess confuses me. And that can be your recommendation, City Council? The applicant is here and has asked to be heard. Would you like to hear from him? Of course. Mr. Meyer. Hi, David Meyer with Quick Trip. I appreciate you guys hearing us. Um, we're excited to be here in Bastrop. We worked really hard to get to the point that we are. Um, kind of what we, we've met with uh, David and Jennifer, and we've kind of really been working on site plans, and this is where we've gotten is to the C1. And what we kind of are looking at is the CMU form base. We understand why the CMU was, uh, was standardized. Um, we felt that on the east side of this, we're at a hard corner on two major highways that it made more sense to have the CMU on the western side and that this side it was more been more uh, continuous to have C1 on this side and we do have C2 so we looked at building only on the C2 and keeping it as C2 in the CMU we would prefer to have the entire thing be contiguous to C1 um, and we were looking at downgrading the C2 to C1 to help out the area as well um, we just the CMU unfortunately with our our business model doesn't suit us and we felt that you know it's more consistent of for the area to have a C1 and make it fully compatible. So th this would be my question. The CMU side of this, um, under those, those, that zoning, what is it that it does for that corner? Does it keep things back away? Does it keep big, it just keeps parking spots away from, from the front? Is that kind of what it is? 
Yes, yes. The, the form-based code requires the, um, the, the primary building to be uh, pushed up closer to the, the road frontages, so 95 and Chestnut, with the parking behind. Uh, so you would, in, 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 that, in that case, you'd actually push all of that closer to the residential neighborhood as well that is back there. What, uh, what's the layout look like with your site development for C1? For C1? I know we don't have like a copy of it, but could, could, is there a way to yeah, kind sure. of roughly explain <laughs> where, where everything looks? Or okay, sure. So building would be placed in this portion, and then the canopy would be in this portion over here. And so the goal is, if we were to follow the CMU, our entire business would be back here forcing it closer to this residential property. And so kind of what we were discussing is if we had that compromise where we went to C1, we'd actually limit the heavy use on the C2 down to C1. I think it limits 31 heavy use uh, uses going from C2 to C1, and actually 49 uses between C2 to C1. And so we felt it was a good kind of mix, especially since all the other corners, I understand that you know it was built before, but it just seemed more consistent. And if we were on the west side, I understand the CMU. With us being on the east side, kind of on the opposite side of the highway away from downtown, we felt that there was more of a consistent use to have the C1. It was kind of a good compromise to get, you know, to reduce that C2 to a C1. Is there a way to lay it out where the, the building portion sits more on the CMU side and the pumps are over on the C2 side? Where if I'm driving down 95, I'm not looking at pumps immediately off 95, I'm looking more at like buildings? So we've been through so many site plans. That, topography wise, um, We've tried, I don't think we would be able to make that happen. Really, I mean. I know the topography is not ideal, so. You're yeah, very correct on this site. Um, yeah, I mean, really the best model we've come up with uh, is just placing, and this is kind of as far as we could on this, is kind of place it right in here, and then having the uh, pumps closest to the intersection. And again, I mean, it's, and we've been doing this, and I know we've heard, that we've been doing this 60 years, and for us, to be a good neighbor, what, we, what we've learned is just to try to get the pumps away from the neighborhood as much as we could. And that was kind of what we came to an agreement. It just, it just made sense to keep everything as far away as possible from that. Question Do Are there um, some comments yeah, no. to be made? I wanted to make sure that the commission had, had an opportunity to ask all the questions they wanted. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you. you very Thank much. Okay, uh, Carlton Harris. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Um, first time doing this, so I'm kind of nervous. Don't be, uh, it's just us. Okay. We're all your neighbors. That's right. <laughs> I'm glad the young man just said that they wanted to be a good neighbor. Uh, my opinion is that if they put that station there, and I know this is a zoning, that it wouldn't be in as a good neighbor. Um, I'm looking at the curve there where you come off of Chestnut and turn on the 95. Uh, coming home, there have been many times that I've almost gotten hit because people don't yield. But with that station there, then we're talking about an increase of traffic, uh, which is one of my major concerns as a resident in that area. Uh, also, I'm really concerned, I don't know, maybe you can explain to me as far as it being commercial, how would it affect us as far as tax purposes of concern or other changes that will be made on the, in that area as a result of that being put there? A commercial, a commercial business should not affect a residential appraisal. Okay. Not at all. I mean, yeah. I mean okay. as long as you're not backing up to a number of industrial spots, but just one I wouldn't think would, would do that, but that's not... That would be up to the appraisal district on how they would do that. Okay. So, um, I don't know if this is the right place to kind of voice my opinion about it. We, we, my my in-laws have been up there over 100 years. Uh, there's limited traffic. Station comes, now we're talking about an increase of traffic with the probability of different, because where that's going to be, once that's put up, um, wow, it's going to be less than 100 feet that people are going to be right in front of our houses. And I was just looking and observing through the, through the uh, neighborhood, the, the 
KFC and the Shell across the street, there are no residents there. I can see the station being there. Bucky's, there's no residents around that other than the apartments that's behind that. But this is going to be right in our doorstep once it's built. We're going to have to look at that uh, on a continuous basis along with anything else that goes along with it. And so I did put, turn my paper in saying I was objected to it coming there. I don't know if you all will have any impact there because I don't see it being feasible, especially, and you live here, Thanksgiving, Christmas, uh, any holiday, you're talking about an impossibility of getting in and out of there, then we're going to put this there where there's going to be an increase of, uh, of traffic. I don't see the logic of it being put on the corner. Uh, it's, 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 I don't see it at all, other than the fact that it's just going to increase traffic. And it's going to be crazy. Especially on holidays, for me to get out of Spring Street on the 95, or even go down uh, C.P. Johnson Lane to Chestnut, it's almost impossible to get out on the highway. You know what I mean? So it, that is just going to be a, more of a nuisance to increase traffic in that area. So that's basically my opinion right now. Thank you. Thank you. Stop. I can turn off my phone. Um, we have um, Claudie Johnson. Claudie? Sorry. Well, two of them back like cars, and I'm a little nervous. But I'm that house across the street. And like he says, the traffic in the last five years is terrible. And to come off of Chestnut, there used to be Highway 21. There's a big, uh, the state has it, and there's that uh, concrete wall. And to come around that loop, you can't get out. It's very, very hard. You got to sit there and you got to wait. Then people don't put the signals on. The people at the movie theater, they don't know how to put this signal on that I'm going to the movie. Or they come around and then you just, you know, it's have been bad accidents there and y'all live here. And you know, like he says, across the street, there's Kentucky. Up there is Bucky's. Between six in the morning and ten at night, it's ridiculous. I, you know, I don't want to stop the people. And we do have animals. And we were across the street is farmland, and we do keep our horses and our cows and our little animals. And then we have neighbors on the side of us who have their animals. And I just can't see a service station. Right now, when you're coming around off of Chestnut, what used to be 21, and getting on 95, people don't read. There's yield, stop. You see the traffic coming off her, stop. They'll try to, and you can sit there during the day, and you can hear them blowing at each other. And they don't, you know, now, if you're going to put a service station there or whatever, you're going to have to take out that whole front. Then you're going to have to think. Well, should I, should I, shouldn't I? You know, and that used to not be commercial, but my family member thinking the land was going to be, get you a lot of money, made it, and should have left it farmland like it was, and maybe, maybe one of these days when we're gone, they'll do something. But uh, that's one of my uh, things about it. It's just too much, and I don't want to stop these people from doing their, you know, their development. Apartments, yeah, we can handle apartments, maybe. But that steady, steady traffic from a service station and coming off the hill, and how are you going to think about which way do I go in? Do I go around here and try to swoop in before that traffic comes? But, uh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Arbuckle, you want to speak on the next item or this item? This item, okay. I'm sorry, I was at home watching on, on my phone and, and rushed over here when I saw what you were talking about. Um, I too am nervous, although I have done this before, but I still get nervous. 
I live across the street, and so it really, I live across from the Performing Arts Center. But I want you guys, before you make this decision, I want you to drive down Chestnut towards downtown on a clear, beautiful day. And I want you to do it on a clear, beautiful night. And I want to, you to, that to be your first introduction to Bastrop. It is a beautiful drive-in. And if you put a gas station there with all the lights that come with the gas station and all the traffic that comes with it and the pumps and the metal, you lose that thing that is so Bastrop. And I think it's important when we're making decisions on where businesses are going to go, and I think that this was considered when this was zoned, highest and best use has to include environmental beauty, um, aesthetics. And I know it doesn't, and I know that highest and best use is supposed to be the highest profit, and, and that's, I, I just disagree with that. I think that that's the not always the case. <laughs> Thank you. I think that the community and the aesthetics of the community are as important to the growth of a town and to the uh, managed growth of a town. And so I just, I, I would be really sad to see that property developed in that kind of a uh, commercial way. Um, I'm sad that it's a commercial mixed use in the first place. I'm concerned about that being commercial mixed use for another reason is next to it I think is a, is a homestead of some sort. And then we have the historic uh, cemetery. So you know that's going to really affect that. So you've got a whole corner that is really important to Bastrop, the character of Bastrop. Um, and I, if I lived behind there, I would be horrified to have a gas station there. I love gas stations. I stop at them all the time. Um, I have no qualms with gas stations, but I think there's appropriate places for them, and there's not appropriate places for them. I don't think that would be appropriate. If he owns all this property that's behind the brown, you know, I, I, I would, I don't, if it were close, because they have the mechanic shop up there. Um, you know, there's some, there are some other things that are up there, but I just think that this is, one thing I do have a question about, and that is, I'm assuming he's already purchased this, okay, I'm assuming he's already purchased this property. When purchasing a property, do people not do their due diligence, or they just assume that, that, that it's going to change for them? So, you know, I'm sorry if it's not going to work out the way that he wants it to, or that it is, it sounds like it might, but... I would assume they're probably in the due diligence phase. I would assume that, that a commercial developer wouldn't purchase a property without okay. going through this. Well, this good. <laughs> so anyway, that's that's my two cents. Thank you. Thank you. Is, that, is that it? We have anybody else? Is there anyone else who wishes to speak? If not, we'll close the public hearing. Any more comments from the commission? So I just, from an education standpoint, I just want all the neighbors to, to realize that this is, you know, that corner is currently zoned commercial, the whole, uh, different variations of commercial, but at some point, someday, whether it's next year or 10 years from now, somebody's gonna develop something there, it's likely gonna be commercial. Um, and like we said earlier, in that CMU section, fuel sales is already acceptable, it just makes this site plan different. So just keep that in mind for the future that that's what this is. Um, I just, as an education piece, just as a reminder, so. Um. Jennifer, you have anything else? No. I have a question for Jennifer. You mentioned earlier if we stayed with CMU, they could do it, but we'd end up having to issue variances mm -hmm. against it so that they could do it. Yes. So it would keep the CMU zoning, but we'd have other stuff to add on top of it. C1 just makes it a cleaner process. Yes, and, and with most variances, the, the standard staff response is that not to recommend variances. So. Okay. That would be for the variance board, though, I think so. Yeah, and that would go before the Zoning Board of Adjustment, not the Planning and Zoning Commission. Commission? I have a motion. I have a motion to deny the rezone of this corner. I will second that. Or you can also do an alternate motion that the applicant can take or withdraw as well, so. If you wanted what's, to make what's well, because the, one way or the other, they're going to have to have this be one zoning if they're to develop it. So, as we said, so you can develop under CMU or can, C2. Can they not go through the replatting process then until the zoning issue is 
is taken care of? Yeah, we cannot approve the final plan until okay. those zoning issues are taken care of. I, I would we want to offer the applicant an opportunity to withdraw? Is that what you Or, or you can do an alternate motion to say that you recommend the whole thing be CMU, and that can be forwarded to council as well. But if it's to be one zoning district, it would be C CMU rather than. No, and, and that may still not work for the applicant, and they may choose to withdraw. My motion is going to stand to deny okay. the rezone of this corner as requested. And if they'd like to resubmit or if they want to work the numbers again, it sounds like CMU is not going to work for them at all for this corner. So I don't see the point in sending to council the recommendation to rezone all of it as CMU. So my motion will stand to deny the rezone as requested. I stay with my second. So if you want it all CMU, you would vote for your motion. No. Oh, you're, you're, I, you're, you're voting to no, the motion is to deny the application, deny the application. as requested for okay. a reason of any kind. Of any kind, all right. And if they like to do CMU, then it'd have to be a, a resubmittal. That's, that's my motion. You, are we still second? And I still second. Okay, I'm just making sure. Debbie Debbie Moore? No. Well, are you, no I am you, voting against his recommendation to not approve. Okay. Patrick Connell? Yes. Diana Rose? Yeah. So, okay. Can I get clarification? Turn on your mic, please. I'm sorry. I just need clarification because I know Patrick made a motion in a second. Mm -hmm. He wants to, de to deny. A yes denies it, a no yes. approves it. Or a yes, a, a yes agrees with Patrick, yes. Gotcha. Thank you. <laughs> so, Diana Rose? Yeah. Still, okay. Cynthia Meyer? Yes. Richard Gartman? Yes. Matt Lassen? Yes. Cheryl Lee? Yes. Okay. So five to five to ten. Oh. Matt will be forwarded on to the June 10th meeting. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, can you might explain for the audience that applicant has the right. Well, come on up to the, the mic, Dave. Applicant has the right to carry it on to city council. So I encourage you all to come to City Council and say exactly the same things that you said, and they have the right to make it one way or the other. But the recommendation from PMZ is to leave the zoning as it is. Recommend that everybody who spoke tonight come. This is just the first step. Yes, sir. It, it's up to it's up to the applicant at this point to decide whether or not they'll be able to develop with the zoning the way it is. Thank you. Item four: it's updates. Update on the draft. Yeah, we, got we got one. We got we got more. What? Hmm? We got one more. Three. Oh, I'm sorry. Three. <laughs> Stepping on down the road there. there. You already have the traffic got to me this afternoon. <laughs> Three E public hearing and consider action to recommend approval of a subdivision variance to waive the requirement of section 5.20 streets to improve our post fiscal surety for the construction of 50% of CP Johnson Lane between Farm Street and Fairview Cemetery and forward to City Council for consideration at their next hearing. Yes, so this was a request, as it was stated, to waive the subdivision requirements to improve a post fiscal surety for road improvements during the subdivision process. So what the situation is at this location is the landowner um, owns currently three lots. Um, they've been de-divided over the years, and now they're trying to clean up um, the, the, the lots and reconfigure them slightly with a subdivision plot. So they're going through um, the, the plot process currently. Um, they have um, they have access off of Farm Street, which is constructed, but there is C.P. Johnson Lane uh, to the east that is um, right of way that is not um, currently improved. It's grown over, and um, I think it's at best it's ever been a dirt road. So in the subdivision process, any streets that, um, that are adjacent to or going through a uh, subdivision are required to provide the um, portion of the improvements that are adjacent to um, their subdivision. So in this case, it would be half of C.V. Johnson Lane. During the subdivision process, the applicant would have to provide either the fiscal uh, surety or to actually Im provide the improvement and build the road. So what the request is, um, is to 
not uh, have to build that section of the road and still be able to finish their subdivision plat. Um, in section nine of the subdivision ordinance, there is a provision that if the regulations would cause uh, necessary hardship if strictly adhered to, um, in this case, uh, I think we've estimated that the cost of 50% of that road would be around $60,000. And in this instance, um, the applicant is not creating any new lots. It's three lots. They're still putting three lots in that location. It's just a reconfiguration, so it's not creating any additional density in this location. And also, the, in some condition particular to the site, the departure may be made without destroying the intent of the code. Uh, this roadway does not continue. It ends at the cemetery. It's a, it's a back entrance into the cemetery. Um, and the city does still want to retain that right of way. Um, as uh, a, ma a maintenance entrance to, into the cemetery, but um, we would be okay with not having the applicant improve the road at this time. So staff recommendation is to recommend approval to city council uh, to approve the subdivision variance to not require uh, these improvements. Would any of the lots have access on C.P. Johnson or are all their lots access onto Farm Street? They all access onto Farm Street. They all three have, um, they all access Farm Street. Okay. Just out of curiosity, how would our draft subdivision ordinance apply to the situation? There would be no specific change to that other than you would have the final say on whether to grant the waiver. And the new okay, so, 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 a, so a situation like this would still require a, a waiver? That's correct. Okay, I got it. it. It's not up to staff to decide who has to build what, so... No, I, I, I get it. I'm just, I'm just making sure, cause, and this is kind of goes off some of that stuff where we have like a citizen that's trying to do something with their stuff without really impacting anybody else and whether or not they'd still have to go through the process, but right. that makes sense. Okay. I mean, kind of a question as far as, I guess, the way the code works as well on this. So Jennifer said this was an old back entrance to the cemetery. Um, under current code, if the city were to have created a back entrance, wouldn't they have needed to develop that road going to their back entrance to the cemetery? Well, this road right has been planted since the 1800s. Yeah. And so. from what I understand, it was in use up until about 20 years ago, and the city has since closed off the, the gate, the Correct. cattle guard has grown in with trees, and the city has kind of once used it, but has left it to disrepair since they closed the gate. Right, but we did send this request through to the cemetery board, uh -huh. and they wanted to re retain the, the access. Well, it's, it's not so much retain the access. I guess it's this idea that s streets are redone in Bastrop all the time, and I don't think we're forcing people to pay for them that live on those streets, or yeah, maybe I'm wrong. Or if people that live downtown go to replot their properties, such as they may have to do in the future with the way that the, the draft code is written, are they going to be asked to to if, put aside a little bit of money for the redo of their road? If the road is unimproved, then yes, we would require that they consider. Now, is that, is that considered like sidewalks, gutter? Because a lot of roads in Bashup don't have sidewalks, and there's a lot of houses on it that are. Uh, we generally require sidewalks with all the new subdivisions. Now, the reason the staff agrees with this one is that they're not creating any new laws. Yeah, and I, and I think you're on. I think you're on point with that. I guess I'm just trying to figure out if we force all of down. I mean, more. I know this isn't really a discussion for right now. We could probably table it, I guess, until we bring the other stuff up. But you know, if we go ahead with the way the draft of the subdivision ordinance is written, potentially, not only do people have to pay for a plot of property that's already been developed, but now they're going to have to set aside money for curb, gutter, sidewalk. I think, I think you and I are on so. the same page with this, but I think there, I, don't, I don't think there's a good way to write into the ordinance the exceptions for something like this, and so no, no, no. this and process would, would alleviate that. And I completely agree. I'm more just back to the issue of going back to the 1981 statute that we've and, had. And I, the I think you and I were, had, had the same ideas as right. whether this could be alleviated, but I think yeah. that's what this is. But 1981 really doesn't have an effect on this because what they're doing is they're, re, they're moving lot lines. It's, it's not that they're trying to create a plot of the existing lots. They are reconfiguring the lots. So it is a Yeah, and I, and I, I agree change. that this is a bit of a unique circumstance right. compared to most. But again, back to the original question, I, it feels like this is a, a road that the city has had ownership at one time and just failed to take care of. And now we're asking the landowners on either side of the road to make up for that negligence is kind of the way it feels. Yeah. I, mean, I know we're not. I know we're asking yeah. to not do that. Yeah. But it's just more the idea that... If you weren't asking for this, that's what the code is supposedly requiring. 
Yeah, and I don't know what you're asking, but say that they were doubling the number of lots. So they were inc uh, increasing the amount of traffic. Completely agree. She would want Completely to do agree. That. And no, so that's why we totally different story. with no additional lots, then we support the request for yeah. the variance. Since we all agree that we're not asking them to do anything, does anybody else have any questions regarding Motion recommendation? To, motion to approve as is. Second. Motion and second. Baby, call the roll, please. Mm -hmm. Debbie Moore? Yes. Patrick Connell? Yes. Diana Rose? Yes. Cynthia Meyer? Yes. Richard Gartman? Yes. Matt Lassen? Yes. Cheryl Lee? Yes. One thing our subdivision ordinance rewrite has done is made us a lot more aware of what's going on in this. Yes. <laughs> Speak up. Now can we go to updates? <laughs> Have I missed anything else? All right. Uh, update on the draft subdivision ordinance. Mr. Gaddis. Well, we're still plugging away. Um, I don't have a new ordinance to show you because I really haven't made all the changes, but I have a list of things that we're going to be working on, including tweaking a lot of record requirements. And again, all of this is based on the comments that were received at the joint meeting, uh, tweaking some of the tree requirements, uh, looking at some easement requirements, particularly the stream bank easements. There was questions about what you could, couldn't do in there. Uh, probably doing a little bit more on descriptive on uh, residential roads, including uh, bike facilities. Um, looking at sidewalks in the ETJ, and I'm probably going to limit a lot of that infrastructure requirement to just the statutory ETA, ETJ uh, portion where we would have normal authority. The unusual un and unique uh, aspect of, asp of Bastrop having all this large amount of voluntary ETJ kind of uh, makes that a little difficult. Um, looking at incentives for floodplain development to use detention ponds as multi-use parks and how we can uh, incorporate that. Uh, I already have some information on street lights and colors and I already have language to put into that, uh, which is probably not going to mean anything except to lighting people. Uh, <laughs> but the idea is to keep it a, a warmer, uh, uh, or more of a, almost a yellowish light, uh, light that's easier on the eyes and stuff. So the next step is we're talking about public meetings, and so we have scheduled. Um, well, Dave, we have one thing about any additions to um, homes. We had said 120 yes. square feet. Yes, and I think that, we talked about. That's part of the tweaking of the lot of record. A lot of record. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, and I need to learn not to say legal lot of record, even though that's kind of a term of art. It's just a lot of record. When, when you talk about legal lots of record, and even though technically we are talking about legal lots of record, people get kind of get upset about they may not have a legal lot of record. But anyway, the next step is to move forward on uh, public outreach. And so we have scheduled, actually there are four meetings on uh, June 13th and 14th. Uh, Wednesday, June 13, we'll have our public meeting here that evening on a Wednesday night. So hopefully you will all be here to listen to what is said. And then on Thursday, meeting in the morning with developers and home builders. Uh, at lunch, I'm speaking to the, the Realtors uh, luncheon. And uh, Thursday afternoon, I'll be speaking to engineers and surveyors. And of course, you all are welcome to come to those and hear what they have to say as you well. Got, you got it on your own as far as I'm concerned, because my, my daughter's graduating from high school in California, and yeah. I'm out of here. I'm 13. Can, 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 can we individually come to Yes, yes. Uh, they're all public meetings. The only thing that is not technically a public meeting would be the Board of Realtors luncheon. So. And they, they may charge you for lunch. And with that, I'd be happy to answer questions. Otherwise, we'll keep playing. Yes, on. Dave, on the public meeting, how will that be advertised so everyone in our great city will know about this so they can come? Well, uh, Sir O'Brien has kind of taken over a lot of the um, uh, advertising and um, uh, once we're, what we're doing is we're finalizing the mailing lists for, you know, all the engineers and surveyor mailing lists, all the developers and home builder mailing lists. Uh, then I'm sure there'll be some, uh, you know, Facebook and web page and all that kind of uh, advertising as well. Right. I would also just uh, ask everyone on the board and everyone listening now too, please share the information because word of mouth's the best. So, the more the better.
I was going to say, kind of, kind of just addressing the board, just a few thoughts from, I guess, our meeting last time with the city council. And, uh, yeah, I go back. I've been thinking a lot about what Linda said at one point. You know, again, I know I actually really like this code, despite the fact that I know I'm kind of harping on this one issue all the time. And I feel like Dave doesn't want to hear from me a whole lot. But, um, you know, it, as we just learned tonight, now there's potentially not just replatting involved with, you know, removing this 1981 clause. Um, but possibly redeveloping your street or putting money aside for redeveloping the road in front of the house. And I think we all understand that in terms of creating new lots and you know more density and how that would affect it. Again, we're kind of going back to you know someone who's just trying to survive on their own piece of land and they're not necessarily trying to make money off others. Um, but Linda said she didn't care. She's like, look, you want to cut it out, cut it out. You want to add it, you want to do this. What she really wants is the rest of this code. It seems like for 99% of this code is fantastic. It's this 1% that I know for a fact, given the number of calls I've received and people I've talked to just in the last two or three weeks, that it's going to be really difficult for council, in my opinion, to pass this code as written with that piece in it. You're going to have a number of people packing this room, taking their three minutes to make their comments over something that really the city has dealt with for the last at least since 1981 and the city is still here you know you know I, I look through the county records a little bit to see what were a lot of records and if you look closely they, they'll tell if they've been subdivided and if there's kind of part of a subdivision you know versus just a, a breakout of a certain block and uh, yeah a lot of the city is not platted this downtown including a lot of the city property that's owned is unplatted and it just seems to me it would be cleaner if we left the 1981 ordinance and got this code passed and then this is a, in a topic that can maybe it's just being pushed down the road and has to be dealt with in another 10 15 years when it's rewritten but you know i i like the code i would hate to see it derailed over this one issue um i'm personally not willing to derail it over this one issue i mean i think that they've made great strides to kind of make it more palatable but now if someone has to replat, you know, we're not looking at just the thousand dollars to replat, but potentially sixty thousand dollars to redo their road depending on where they live. And it yeah, it's I would I would say we should consider leaving that nineteen eighty one clause in that the previous code had and just consider all the lots that were in existence prior to that date and still have the same form and consider them legal lots of record. I, I so. believe that still applies. Correct. Correct. Like the, the only difference would be that we're adding a trigger that even if you have a lot of record and you build more than 20% or yeah. however, one, it, it would require you, you would require so that's, that's the issue that we're talking about. And I think that was just one of those issues where there's got to be, it's got to be there. It's just a matter of what the trigger is for that. I, and on that, I disagree just that it has to be there. I mean, I think that the city's dealt with this issue for potentially 100 years and we're still standing you know stuff still goes i mean the city has made the argument that this would help clean up knowing where our utilities are in fact it would help us know where utilities are on private property but we still don't know where utilities are on public property and i don't see it going i mean the city i do believe that this block we're on right now wasn't replatted when the city rebuilt this property i mean it was i think part of the original plot back from 18 you know you know, 63, whenever the original plot was done, you know, the city did replot the convention center because they were combining, you know, three or four different blocks. The old city hall is unplatted. I mean, it's still standing. It still has services. And, you know, the city just did a massive remodel of that just a few years ago. And, you know, and, and this is the city feeling that the code was sufficient for saying it didn't need to be replatted. You know, if it were such a big deal that, that we had to have a replat for a remodel or for tearing a building down, adding square footage, the city would have done it eight years ago when they redid the old city hall and made it the museum that it is now. And so I guess, I guess my opinion would be, I'm going to use your own words against you, from, from earlier when it's, you know, continuing a bad practice doesn't necessarily mean we should continue a bad practice, which I, I think that probably is. That's just my opinion. That we, at some point it's got to stop and I think acknowledging that there's a problem and having a solution although a difficult solution is better than kicking it to the next generation of whoever sits here in these seats and whoever's working in planning and development. I think it's, I think it's a valid point. I just, I just think... Uh, Use your mic. Use anybody's mic. I'll use your mic. I just think that um, and, and Matt's 
uh, argument that there's a certain amount of burden that's being put on the people that own those lots or want to purchase those lots or want to sell those lots. Um, the burden is being put on them to figure out why the city doesn't know where their utilities are. Or, you know, I mean, that's not, that's not the homeowner's fault that the utility, utilities that are underground, uh, you know, on Water Street, a gas line breaks. They don't even know where the gas line is. You know, that's, that's, no, you don't know that. Yeah. Street. But, but it's, it, it's ridiculous that, that that burden is being put to replat and pay out of their pocket and fix roads and do the things that, that should have been done probably many years ago. From the from the utilities uh, to to find and know and locate that maybe they should maybe the cities themselves well, should you know, put the it in their budget. The purpose of planning is not to find where the utilities are. Yeah. The purpose of planning is to provide that adequate facilities. But in the to, process to that of it, so you need to figure out where things are, whether you need easements on the property, right. etc. But in the process and, of it, I, I ran into that on, yeah. across the street, and it was ridiculous because. Be, because the re we had to do the title company's job, which was go figure out how come all these lots were separated and half our house was on somebody else's lot, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, well, that, that, I think that's a prime yeah. example of why plotting going forward is but, important because right, of the situation but, but like it that. Right, was, but it, it, was, it was definitely a burden, so, uh, and it cost us more to, to try to use And we weren't even building. We were just simply remodeling. We didn't change anything. And by the way, I have recommended that the city plan Sorry. all of its property. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? I'm sure that's something that's going to come up in the discussions that we have on on all the public hearings and yeah. the discussions. And um, it could be before it's finally recommended to council that changes are made. And that segues into my question. So thank you, <laughs> Debbie. So Dave, just timeline curiosity I know we have no idea when but we've got the public meeting we've got the developers home builders we've got the engineers you have all the input next step in a perfect world I would bring back a revised ordinance to you at your uh, June meeting and then the City Council could consider it in July but I know it's not a perfect world and there are things the hiccups that may occur so but that's the, the idea would be to bring the Final ordinance to you in June, and then go to City Council in July. So when you bring, sorry, when you bring that to us after all of this input, mm -hmm. will you be taking input again, just like something Matt brought up? Can we still have input for things that we want to make sure will pass? I, I will bring to you a draft ordinance. Uh, you are required to have a public hearing that night before you consider that. If you so choose, you could you know, consider additional input or, uh, you know, uh, continue it to another meeting. I mean, that's, there's all, you have all kinds of options. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. And just as an FYI, this is my swan song. This is my last official day here. Uh, having said that. Official. Last official day. Uh, I have given Linda a, uh, an agreement to continue specifically to work on the subdivision audit, so you will probably see me again, uh, assuming she signs it. So. <laughs> but I, I have thoroughly enjoyed working with you all. If she does not sign it quickly, then we It's signed? Yeah. Okay, it's signed. <laughs> You're on the hook. <laughs> Just in case you weren't aware. <laughs> you can't go anywhere. You're here. Okay, that's 4A. 4B is an update on the draft mobile food vendor ordinance. Um, so the update is that we're still working on it. Um, we actually met today with the county health district to kind of go over and get some feedback from them on um, their inspection process and how it will work um, on mobile food vendors in the city limits. Um, and so my um, plan on this is to have a um, update in, uh, in the meeting in June and then have a final draft um, for public hearing at the meeting in July so it can go to council in August. Cool. Sounds good. Any questions? No. Um, I was just going to say, any update on the electronic sign? Um, we're, still, we're still working on that. There are um, the paper article uh, stated that the city is currently negotiating. We are not actually negotiating. This has just been a, a thank question. You for, thank you for clarifying. Yeah. That was going to be a question before we close out because I called David and was like, um, I feel like <laughs> I missed yeah. something. No, this has been a request would the city be interested in this. And so what we're in is the um, research phase of what, what do we want to propose uh, to y'all to look at. 
um, as standards for a potential, you know, code amendment or or availability of a swap or changes in the future. Okay. And we're, you know, exploring. The, it can affect. So um, one thing was pointed out is right now we have a we're a scenic city. We have a certification as a scenic city, and one of the large point uh, totals in that is your sign code on limiting billboards and. Um, limiting changes to non-conforming signs. So those kind of things are things that we'll, we'll come back with in our research. So, so. hot and topic yeah. on that. Right? Yes. Cool. <laughs> one, but one item that we used to have on here, I think just before adjournment, is uh, requests from any of the commission members for inclusion of, of the director for inclusion on the next uh, uh, commission meeting. And I'd kind of like to see that brought back, if we could, so that if things come up like like this, or if something that we're interested in and want to explore more, that we can we can have it. And the public will know. But next month we're going to be talking okay. about it. So just for for reference, mm -hmm. okay. we just have to be careful not to get too far off topic in that That's right. discussion. <laughs> there you go. Okay. All right. Item five. Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. Second. Any opposition? No. Thank you, everybody. Opposed to extend.